Hello, this is Jean Marie Ward for BuzzyMultimedia.com. With me tonight is best-selling author Mercedes Lackey and writer and artist Larry Dixon. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Glad to be here. Yeah, at DragonCon. <laughs> and at DragonCon, that's right. Having been to your panel on Saturday night, I got to ask you. What is a metahuman, and how the heck did you guys get involved with them? Well, a metahuman is a superhuman or super super superhero, but DC Comics has the trademark on superhero, so we had to call them something else. They trademark superheroes? Yes, they did. Now they're not heavily enforcing that, but we just didn't want to get into any problems before things started, so we called them metahuman, which is something beyond human. And this is something for a project called The Secret World Chronicles that you do as a podcast as well as a novel. It started out as a podcast. Actually, before that, it started out with a bunch of us doing role-playing our metahuman characters, which are called heroes in the MMORPG City of Heroes, which we still play and still adore. We created such char compelling characters that we decided we'd try and take them a little farther. And eventually we created our own setting, took those characters, and some of them have changed substantially from what they, act what they were when we played them. Some of them have remained the same. Some of them have been somewhere in the middle. And we started putting together a big long story arc for them and I wanted to do this as a series of novels but since I'm known for fantasy writing superhero fiction is kind of a hard sell so instead we did podcasts made them free in order to build an audience so that we could take this to a publisher and say, say we actually have a built-in audience. And as of today, we've had over two million downloads. That's awesome. So it's pretty wonderful. The c podcasts will continue. They will continue to be free. Bain Books that bought the books is very much behind this. As you are aware, where the uh, Bain Books is quite innovative in many ways. So they are very much behind us continuing to do the podcast. The podcasts are kind of a rough draft of the book. Some things get cut. That's especially true of the, big, of the first book. Mostly what happens now is that we are adding material between the time that we do the podcast and the time we finish the book. So the books generally have a little bit more than was ever in the podcast. The podcast will also have material that, for one reason or another, doesn't fit into the book. Right now we're on fifth, what we call fifth season. The podcast we break up into seasons, and we're on fifth season, which is kind of some intermediate material that could have been in the books, but there's no real place for it, but will be very interesting to the fans. Backstories, secret backstories, uh, backstories additional adventures, yeah. Yeah, especially we've got some of John Murdoch's backstory coming up. And is it a spoiler to say what happened to him? <laughs> oh, everybody dies, yeah. No. Oh, everybody dies. <laughs> everybody it's dies. Good. <laughs> it's, a, it's a flashback he, that he has that takes place literally in between the beginning of the, th the third book that will be published and the end of the second book that will be coming out in January. It's the end of the beginning of the middle of the... Oh. You're a very silly man. <laughs> very silly man. <laughs> and it's, it's, it takes place when he's sort of killing some time in a motel room and something that Vicky says to him in her overwatch role mm -hmm. uh, 
makes him do a flashback to when he first escaped from the project. And you each write primarily the adventures of the character that you played in City of Heroes. So can you give us your characters and who they are, Larry? Well, actually, that's a tricky one because uh, I've I've eliminated every character that I played from the actual Secret World Chronicles. Oh. Uh, but this, strangely enough, coincided with me becoming series editor on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what I'm able to bring to the project isn't so much a specific character. It's that uh, the, the whole metahuman superhero, if you will, genre uh, really thrives in comic books. And I have experience in the comics field. I even worked retail. Uh, and been a lifelong comics fan, so uh, I know a lot of the traditions, the tropes, and what came before. Mm -hmm. And uh, this can be a real pain for everybody that's involved in the project because they'll say, I've got this really awesome idea. And I'll say, yeah, uh, Bashima and Lee did that in 1976 here. In, and they'll go, oh, I thought that was original. I was going, no, it wasn't original when it was done in 76 or 83 or 89. <laughs> or in a, and, and you're still alive. Yeah, I am. I oh, am. my goodness. It's because we work at a distance, you know. They just can throw a knife that far. Yeah, that helps. <laughs> Does he ever do that to you? All the time. All the time. Uh, yeah. and, it's and he's still alive. You live with him. What's awful about it is I feel like such a buzzkill sometimes because they'll have such excitement over coming up with something. But, you know, there have been a lot of truly great minds that have worked in the comics field that have come up with wonderful, wonderful things. And so sometimes we wind up with what's called convergent evolution where another great mind will come up with the same idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I come along and kind of deflate them, sadly. But uh, it's all right. It, it, uh, it, it lets us make entirely new mistakes rather than repeating old ones. And, and finding ways to shuffle back out of those mistakes once we've got them in print is, uh, or is challenging. Or even when he says, well, somebody did something like that, that will we just find a new way to do it? Quite so. Yeah. yeah. Quite so. Have, yeah. You, have you done this for your character? And I, I missed, somehow I missed who your character was. She's got some great ones. My, oh. my, my characters are uh, Belladonna Blue, mm -hmm. who is evolved a good bit from what she was originally in as, we, as I, as I role-played her. She was a lot more fragile, and she's got quite a spine and if she wasn't a she, I'd say she has quite a pair. <laughs> <laughs> we can but have pairs. she's got pairs. another kind of pair. <laughs> yeah, we can have pairs. <gasps> uh, she's got a lot of moxie. Uh, Victoria Victrix Naj, mm -hmm. who is my Mary Sue and yet is not my Mary Sue. Uh, she writes. She's a writer. Mm -hmm. She writes romances. That's where you get the name of the series, actually. She writes The Secret World Chronicle. Yes. Uh, and I also write the Seraphim, who has evolved considerably from what she was when I when I role played her. It was very interesting doing the point of view of something that is not human. I've gone into that before in fantasy, but never quite to the extent that I do with the Seraphim as she is in the first couple of books. She has very much an alien and very much a long, long, long uh, viewpoint on things. And a long list of neuroses, I might add, too. No, actually, the Seraphim has no neuroses. <laughs> that's, that's Vicky. That's oh what boy, makes is it ever Vicky. Vicky, yeah, Vicky is true. the neurotic. She really is. You know, it's one thing uh, that to mention here, though, since we were talking about the role-playing, is that uh, I, I recommend having a role-playing group for every writer because whenever you're, you're simply doing prose and sitting at a word processor, you can, you can adjust anything that you want and have an hour to get dialogue right. But the immediacy of a role-playing group is that you have to know the character very well, and then you flash improvise the dialogue. It's very much improvisational theater. Yeah. Yeah. The thing about translating role-play to a professional project is, for the most part, I would tell people don't. Because you need a lot of experience, and you need to have learned to be ruthless with your own stuff before you can ever make that work. 
One of the things about role playing is that it's very satisfying for you on an internal level, but of course, putting it into prose, it's all exposition. You're having to get someone else to understand what you knew intuitively as you were role playing, and uh, that's quite challenging. And it's also challenging to be, as I said, ruthless, where you have to be quite willing to cut or change or accommodate someone else's plans. Or sadly enough, eliminate entire characters or that you realize were fun to role play with, but do nothing for a story. A absolutely. Yeah, it's tough. Absolutely. Killing your darlings, as the yes. saying goes. Yes. <laughs> Quite so. Uh, now, Cody Martin uh, is responsible for John Murdoch, and he's also taken over with me uh, Vertigris, <laughs> which was Steve Lippy. Steve L can't continue with the project. He had, he had chronic cystic fibrosis which went into acute. Oh no. And so he has just does not have the the energy to do anything except concentrate on breathing. Breathing. Yeah. Great guy and and really took one for the team by saying, I gotta go. You know. So I've taken over his character Red Savior, who I actually knew quite well but from all the role play I did with her. Mm -hmm. Um and Cody and I have taken over Vertigris. Dennis Lee is responsible for Red Ginny and Bulwark, who was under another name, similar, but is substantially changed from the character that he role played. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need to fold in multiple characters into a single one, too, mm -hmm. in order to make it fly in a book. Mm -hmm. And Veronica is taking over Mercury, Yankee Doodle, and Ramona Ferrari, who is the only non-metahuman in the group. Mm -hmm. And we all kind of took over Tesla, Nikola Tesla, who is the head of ECHO, mm -hmm. which is the organization that basically handles most of the heroic metahumans in the world. It's a worldwide organization. And their headquarters is right here around Atlanta. Which leads into... <laughs> which leads into <laughs> quiet, quiet Atlanta. Atlanta. When we put this project together, we wanted a city that at least a couple of us were familiar with. Larry lived in Atlanta, Steve lived in Atlanta, I've been in and out of Atlanta several times over over the course of many, many years. Yeah. Plus, for story reasons, we needed a place that would always have the roads under construction. And we also wanted a place that was more central than, oh, say, New York. Mm -hmm. This is going primarily, at least right now, to an American audience, so it had to be an American city. Atlanta's a great town. New York's been done to death. Didn't want to do anything in California. So that pretty much left meant Atlanta was going to be the best bet. Being as it's in Atlanta, i got to ask, are you ever going to drag Dragon Con into this? That would be fun, wouldn't it? We would be neat to have uh, some of the metahumans doing a public appearance at Dragon Con. <laughs> we were actually toying with the notion we have... this. We, we had a... There, we, we've got a plot point, uh, hole. Uh, a here a miracle must occur that we had in the outline that we were hammering out this very weekend because we had all of us in the same room all of, and I got out my whip and I said we must we must figure out what this is for a climax and we were toying with having it at Dragon Con but we decided, decided instead that the the uh, great gathering would be the memorial the one year memorial for the invasion instead uh, but Bummer. And, well, and that is partly because we knew that if Vertigris did what Vertigris is going to do, there would be fans pouring out of, can, uh, of Dragon Con, armed with many, many working weapons as well as non-working weapons, and they would bludgeon him to death with them. <laughs> and we did, we, did not want to, we did not want to do this. That's right, because let's face it, Dragon Con's an armed convention. It is indeed. Uh,